think for the first step is is understanding that how powerful this can be. And you show people that by these examples, just helping them change words and change stories to then see how their breath changes, see how their emotion changes, their energy changes, um, and breaking it down into these really small pieces. And to see how much, how powerful our words are for truly creating our reality. Hello, and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Welcome back everyone to Pursuing Health. I am very excited for today's conversation. We have a repeat guest today, Mark England, who joined me last year in episode 262. So if you have not yet listened to that one, I highly recommend going back to check that out before you listen to this conversation or after. I know they're both going to be great. Uh, a little bit of background on Mark before we dive in. He is a speaker. He is a co-founder and head coach of Enlifted and has been researching, coaching, and presenting on the power of words and stories for the past 15 years. He holds a master's degree in education. He was an elementary school PE teacher before getting into personal development. And through his coaching program and his public speaking engagements, he gives athletes and professionals the tools they need to translate their inner conversation take control of their lives and perform their best. And our previous conversation was a hit. I know I really enjoyed doing some of the examples and exercises that he had for us. So I came today with my paper and pencil as well, just in case there are more more games and exercises, but I'm so excited to pick up where we left off last time, Mark. So thank you again so much for joining me. Thanks for having me back on, Julie. (laughs) Well, I thought we could start for those who maybe haven't heard our first conversation to give them some context on why this is important. You are obsessed with words and stories and language and how this defines our reality, our experience, our identity. And I know for you, it has been a personal and professional journey um, and it's something I've seen personally, why I'm I'm so interested in talking to you again. I've seen the impact of this in my own life and in the life of my patients. And so um, I'm wondering if you could give us an example to start with why this is so important. How, how can just changing our language create such a huge impact on our life and our experience? Two weeks ago, uh, I was helping someone with a story. Mm-hmm. First things first, let's get it on paper. Because most people are very underwritten and I'm not talking about insurance folks. Pick <laughs> up the pen. You want to make life easy on yourself or uh you want to you want to make life easy on yourself as a coach uh uh and and way more valuable your interactions with your clients way more valuable. Get, pick up the pen, get it on a Google Doc too that works. And and help your clients get the stories of ouch and pain and sting and woe from out of their head, which is where most mm-hmm. people keep their stories of ouch and pain and sting and woe. But mm-hmm. I'm, I'm about to – before I tell you the specific story, get down to the specific sentence that was holding the whole thing together from this person I was working with just recently. Uh, uh, if it's okay, I'm going to go off on a patented rant and tangent. Please, please um, do. We always enjoy them. Yeah, me too. About the difference between stories kept in the head and stories that are written down, because there's a very big Mm -hmm. difference. Mm -hmm. Most people keep their stories of misfortune and um, uh, uh, negative events in their head, and they suffer the consequences for them. So helping someone get the 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 words on paper does a lot. So, the, as as far as the stories kept in their head, stories kept in the head, they swirl. They're mm-hmm. seemingly infinite. Where does mm-hmm. this thing start? Where does this thing stop? There's mm-hmm. the worst part again. Ouch. Stories kept in the head are extremely disorganized mm-hmm. compared to once they're written down. Mm-hmm. Where w- stories kept in the head. The story is 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 still in your client, and your client is still in the story because that mm-hmm. whole time doesn't apply to the emotional body thing. That's interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, 
you're not even aware of them when they're circling in your head. Correct. Correct. Because um, uh, it's very easy to to get bought into the story, um, especially the stronger the emotional charge. The mm-hmm. stronger the emotional charge, the 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 higher the believability factor. The mm-hmm. strong, the more the more strongly we feel about something, the easier it is to trick ourselves into believing that we got the story right, like really right the first mm-hmm. time. Especially when it's kind of like like most people's stuff is coming from you know back when they were a kid. So a story mm-hmm. story kept in the head, breath trapped in the chest. The pictures are up close and personal, and it's really hard to get down to. What words are forcing me to see myself as a victim in this circumstance and and then from there how to change them? So mm-hmm. so the, the opposite is picking up the pen, even though it might feel like it weighs 900 pounds, <laughs> and getting the story on paper. Once the story is on paper, it, it's, it's way more easy to uh, uh, observe. It's got a, there's the first word, there's the last word, there's all the words in between, and you and your client are now looking at the same set of words. It's now very organized compared to, 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 uh, one is kept in the head and, um, you've got, you've got some distance, you've externalized this thing and, and then you can start looking at what words are, uh, like I said, forcing people to, to see themselves as the victim. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole language pattern to this victim thing, folks. Um, we went over it twice in the first show. I'll do it again here because it's uh, valuable to think about. The definition, if you've got a pen and a piece of paper, everybody, mm-hmm. pick it up. Because most people have never heard the definition of the victim mentality, much less it. written it down. The victim mentality is an acquired personality trait where a person tends to regard himself or herself as the victim of the negative actions of others even in the absence of clear evidence. The victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. That second sentence is a bullseye. The victim mentality depends, underline that word, everybody, as in it has to have a a habitual thought process. Circle the word habitual. What does that mean? Uh, uh, It accurately implies duration and addiction. Oh, yeah, people can get – met somebody who's addicted to the victim mentality julie Mm -hmm. oh yes what's that what's it like being around them is it fun very draining feels negative (laughs) i don't know if this is being the the the, the video is being recorded but her 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 face she went and thought about it in the delivery (laughs) yeah it's great you know what's you know what's a lot of fun too being on a team being on a team of people and having one person that's just bought in and then you know what happens when that happens they're just looking for the stuff to point out that's negative mm-hmm. and gossip mm-hmm. the gossip table is right around the corner and mm-hmm. one person can can just really wreck a ship real fast mm-hmm. that is swimming in the victim mentality and so that second sentence the it has to have a habitual thought process and so me in my simple mind, I'm like, okay, well, if it has to have a habitual thought process, what are the words? And that's what we've been focusing on for the past 16 years, full-time professionally. What words force people into this thing? Mm-hmm. And, and the, the, and the, the bot, it's, it's, it's a bottomless pit, folks. There's no, there's no end to it. And it, 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 oh, by the way, it wants your friends. The victim mentality wants your friends. It wants your family. It's like the worst multi-level marketing sc- scam mm-hmm. out there. And right <laughs> And then, and then, this like the, the certain words get used, certain stories get shared, everybody gets sucked into it. And on mm-hmm. a coaching relative re- relevant coaching side note, um, if if someone, if a coach is, in my personal and professional opinion, untrained in observing the story, they're going to be likely 
to buy into the coach, into mm-hmm. their client's story. And mm-hmm. I say specifically, do not believe your client's story, observe your client's story. There's a big difference. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. someone observes the story, you get to pay attention to the big five traits. When, and I'll go over those in a second. When someone it believes their client's story, now you're you're flirting with drama bonding. Mm-hmm. And if you if that gets strong enough, now you're into trauma bonding. And um, your client is essentially paying you to believe them, whether mm-hmm. they like that or not, whether they want that or not. They're getting, they're 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 paying to have their their story aggregated. So mm-hmm. when you when you learn to observe the story, you get access to the big five, which is what words are they using? Very important for coaches to track. How fast are they talking? Rate of speech is a it's a very important thing to be able to adjust. The faster the story goes, here, here, here it is, folks. The faster the story goes, the faster your clients tell the story, the harder it is to change. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because the breath gets tra- the faster the story, the tighter the breath. Breath trapped in the chest equals attachment to the words, how they're put together. Good luck changing your client's mind while they're breathing fast and talking fast. You can't get in there. So the words, the rate of speech, their body language, their breathing, and their inflection. And when you're observing those things and you can you're 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 calibr- you're reading your clients, you're calibrating them. Um, lucky them that they get to work with you because once again, most coaches um and they think they're doing a good job, but they think they're doing a, a, a service to their clients, you know, b- believing their story. And if you look at it like this, everybody. Um, if you do a half good job helping your clients with their mindset, they're not going to believe the story that they just told you 20 minutes later because the story has to change. Otherwise, mm-hmm. they just have the same problems. So why should I believe that story now that's going to change? Like I said, if I do my job right in 20 minutes, don't mm-hmm. believe it. Observe it. And and so come to mind, Julie. Uh, I was working with a guy who was – um, uh, uh, very upset with his wife. And he had a couple of stories, a couple of examples of how, um, she wasn't showing up how he wanted her to. And we got one of those stories written down. We got it aired out as in, we got him to, to, to read it, read it slow, get some breath in between each sentence, which down regulated is CNS in, in, in context to the story. And there was one sentence that stood out above the rest here. Here it is. She won't let me live my life. Mm-hmm. We're down to the words folks. And that's where the action <laughs> with mindset. She, she won't let me live my life. And I asked him uh, uh, to, to repeat that sentence, and he did. And I asked him, what kind of picture does that make? He said, well, I mean, just, you know, she's, she's doing that thing to me again. And I, I asked him, how's that feel? And he said, well, I, 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 feel, I don't feel heard, and I feel manipulated. And then I asked him, because I'm not believing him, I'm observing his story, where are, you, where are you breathing? And he's like, oh, my God, it's up here in my chest. Mm-hmm. And then I asked him, hey, what is, that, what is that feeling, that lump in your chest remind you of? And it took him about uh, half a second to go, well, that reminds me of when my parents sat me down in uh, in the kitchen and told me they were getting a divorce when I was nine. Went straight mm-hmm. back there, and that's where you that's where the action is usually mm-hmm. at. Very rarely um, is the is because most most clients will start a conversation about what's going on for them in a general way and something that's going on in their in their adult life. And if you track the thing down, a lot of times you go back to seed events that happened in their childhood. Oh, guess what? He had never written that story down either. Right. And so what happened is that dad left, went across town. He stayed with mom. Mom stayed in the house, which is not an uncommon uh, uh, scenario. And he he felt like he had no say in the matter. Mm-hmm. He felt like he was a victim of circumstance. And he had that story in his head and in his heart. And mm-hmm. then he grows up as an adult, goes out into the world. And because that story's running in the background, that's how that's the lens 
reticular activating system, if you go back and listen to that first show that Julie and I did, Mm -hmm. the reticular activating system, that was the lens that he saw things through. Not, not truthfully, it was, it was shaded. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was, um, cause that's what the reticular activating system do. I'm going to sound smart here for a second. It's called confirmation bias. It's called confirmation bias, everybody. That's when we, we, um, we look for the th- we look for evidence and proof of the things that we already believe and if mm-hmm. someone grows up with a story that i don't have any say in the matter and things just happen to me they walk out into their adult life and that's how they're going to interpret situations on an unconscious level and then they get more evidence more proof that that is the case for them and the thing builds and gets stronger mm-hmm. and so um we 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 went into that story of the divorce and four stepped it. I'm very happy to talk about what that is uh in detail later if you'd like, Jewelry, Julie. Um, and that that's essentially where you unlock the breath. Honestly. Mm-hmm. We're known as the language people. That's nice. It's wonderful to be known for something. We it, we we might as well be known as the is the language in the breathing people because we talk about it so much and push comes to shove it's about the breath i'm here to help mm-hmm. people unlock their breath in context of stories because when that happens um then they can see things different and mm-hmm. so we came out to that same story that we started she won't let me live my life and i had him take that first word take out she and put in i mm-hmm. and he sat there for a second Because part of him didn't like it. Part of him did, though. Mm -hmm. The part of him that wanted to be a victim in the circumstance and not take responsibility flinched a little bit. And then the part of him that knew, oh, yeah, you know what? It's not her. It's me. So the Mm -hmm. sentence went from she won't let me live my life to I won't let me live my life. That's called a projection, folks. And that's where there's there's three main pillars of what we call conflict language and that attribute accounts for these are, these are, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm a, <laughs> what am I? That's a good question. Um, before I got into this line of work, I was an elementary school PE teacher and I had a handful of MMA fights. So <laughs> keep that in mind when you're listening to me. Right. <laughs> and, and so roughly 85% of of the language that people use that script the victim mentality comes down to three things. Projections, you embarrassed me, or dad always talks to me like a child, or um, he made me think we needed to get married. I had a woman come in and she said that right off the bat. Well, three minutes into to talking about her divorce that happened six years ago, and she's still mad about it. And I had her write that sentence down. He made me think we needed to get married. Let's get techie. So when those words are put together in a certain way, she's in the picture and he's in the picture. He's doing something to her. She's on the receiving end. It doesn't matter that it happened six years ago. If I play that story in my head, it's happening right now. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and yeah, so we start taking out those words and putting in, take it out the he's and the she's and the dads and moms and people's first name, putting in I, and now you have a reflection. So I won't let me live my life. And, he, and part of him was like, huh? And I, and I, t- I had him take out won't and put in could. I could let me live my life. And so now we're changing. If you change words, you're changing the picture. Mm-hmm. And if you change words and you change the picture, then you're going to change the energy. And mm-hmm. eventually the breath is going to go, Wow, I've never thought about it like that. <laughs> right. And Julie, I've heard that so much. I have a canned response. <laughs> and 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 it's a little bit sarcastic, I know. Well, that's just me. And and I say, well, that's because you've never been able to think about it like that before. Because mm-hmm. when people talk about, oh, I changed my life, that means they changed their story. And if they change their story, they change their words. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've never thought about it like that before, or I've never looked at it like that before. Because you, you've been using the same old words in the same old way for however long. Two plus two equals four, folks. It just is what it is. And I'll give ourselves a pat on the back, and then we can get into the rest of this stuff because I've been ranting. I've been ranting, folks. I'm good at it. 
we have a definition of mindset. Lucky us. We, yeah, I said that. We have a definition of mindset. And it's super complicated. Good luck trying to understand it. I'm kidding. Here's the enlifted definition of mindset. It's the story that you tell yourself. That's what it is. That's what my about ourself. Mm -hmm. The story of, of what we were we can do and what we can't do, what we're good enough for and what we're not good enough for. And a lot of that, that's an understatement, our opinions. You know, nothing ever works out for me. That's not a unit of measurement. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody's got it so much easier. That's not on the periodic table of elements. Those mm -hmm. are just, those are ideas coming from some stories that haven't been written down. And guess what? You can write them down and you can get into the words. Mm -hmm. And when you have the words, everybody, what words to use less of and why, what words to use more of and why, mindset's now practical as you can practice using it different. Mm -hmm. I love how, like you said, practical and simple that you make it. And and as you said, for most people, these are stories we have been walking around with, carrying with us for our entire lives and are so unaware of them. And so I think for the first step is, is understanding that how powerful this can be. And you show people that by these examples, just helping them change words and change stories to then see how their breath changes, see how their emotion changes, their energy changes, um, and breaking it down into these really small pieces. And to see how much, how powerful our words are for truly really creating our reality. And I'd love, it, you talked a little bit about the projection. I think another example that I find to be really powerful are the negations and how if you are always worrying about the worst possible scenario, what could go wrong, how that often ends up creating that reality for yourself. A thousand percent. I'm, I might've talked about my grandma on, on the last podcast, but she was, she was an Olympic gold medalist in worrying. I mean, she was up there, <laughs> top 10 goats of all time. And, <laughs> and she would just stare. She would stare at worst case scenarios horrible things happening, the family going down in flames. She would mm -hmm. tell us about it. And then it got even weirder. Um, mm -hmm. And she would expect us to be, oh, I worry about you so much. And then she would expect us to be grateful for that. I'm like, I, mm -hmm. what? But that's a, that's another thing. And um, yeah. And then it, it took me a while to figure out what was going on there as in, well, my driving teacher said it when I when I got in the car, 15 and a half years old. He said, look where you want to go because you're probably going to go there. And, um, you know, I won't make that mistake again. That's negation. Mm -hmm. I can't keep living like this. That's negation. Um, I'm not going to walk into the gym and, com and start comparing myself to, to her again. It's, it's, it, and so what we do is we force ourselves to stare at the stuff mm -hmm. that we don't want mm -hmm. and, I, I, and fill I, your body with fear and negative emotions, which then will often attract that reality into your life. Correct. Trap our breath. I mean, I, I was on the, 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 the hippie scene there for a few years. Um, <laughs> I was traveling around on going to festivals and I did a good amount of work in some yoga communities. And I would, uh, have you heard of a vision board, Julie? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I would ask these people, I was like, Hey, you ever put what you don't want on your vision board? And they would go, no, why would we ever do that? And then I, then cause it's a setup. Now I got you. Oh, wh what about your internal vision board? What do you mean? Your imagination. Mm, that's mm -hmm. what that is your imagination mm -hmm. is a board that you put little pictures on little mental movies and if you replay these things then um yeah you want to get all you know metaphysical and law of attract we we at, at the very least we sh we we color how we see things and sometimes we manifest them f just just point blank yeah it's um it's quite the thing and this is i, I brought this i know i brought this up uh Abracadabra. This is not this. There's nothing new about this. This is not some pop uh, um, uh, 
psychology mindset fad, as in staring at the words, getting getting economical, getting considerate, get becoming skilled with the words that you use, that's ancient. Abracadabra, look it up. It's Aramaic. It come it it, it means it translates to with my word I create or with my word I influence. The uh, Aramaic is a very old language, and the mm-hmm. metaphysicians, the teachers, they would triangulate it, wear it around their neck to remind them of the power of their words. And and um, you know, you look into a lot of the spiritual and religious traditions, and uh, a, a lot of them talk about. I mean, the Bible has got something like 24, 26 references to the life and death power of our words. Um, this stuff's not new. It's mm-hmm. just most people's education about their language comes down to spelling, grammar, and mm-hmm. definitions. Mm-hmm. There's more to it than that. Yeah. I think a great example of this, when I remember being a kid and I'd be upset and my parents would say something like, don't you smile or don't you laugh because they knew Good that one. would make me laugh or smile, right? Even though you say That's don't, parenting. you can't you can't help but smile when you hear the word smile, right? That's a that's that's a very fun conscious use of negations. Half I've worked with a lot of parents. I worked with a lot of everybody over the years, and um, a lot of times they'll say, you know, I hate repeating myself. Parents will mm-hmm. say that, and I know exactly what they're talking about when they say that. They're using negations. So don't talk back to me. When I say don't talk back to me, I just made a picture of them talking back to me. <laughs> and oh, by the way, they did too. Just like when your parents said, don't laugh, Julie, don't smile. And then you're like, ah, I just made a picture of me smiling and there's the smile. Or mm-hmm. you, you, you can't leave until you finish your vegetables. Or uh, don't get your clothes dirty. Don't get your Sunday clothes dirty. And now everybody in the room is making a picture of dirty clothes. And, mm-hmm. and then and, and at the very least, I upset myself. And guess what, folks? If you got kids, you're going to repeat yourself. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> might as well learn to do it well. Okay, that's right. So, that's right. Uh, you're a good well, listener. You're a good listener. <laughs> that's right. And I can relate on this topic myself. I think I just recently uncovered a story that I was telling myself about something that may or may not happen in the future, but I was going to the scenario that to me seemed the most scary. And I kept, whenever I would think about that, I would play it out of my head. What would it be like? What would I feel? Who would I talk to? And as soon as I, and these stories can be so sneaky because even when you think you, and seductive, right? It's sometimes they, they masquerade as true. It's, it's very sneaky. And so identifying that story and then it's very hard to change your story because everything in your body is telling you, no, it really likes that previous story. It's used to telling that story. It's used to releasing the brain chemicals and neurotransmitters that feed that story. And so if you can overcome that and change your story and start to create new patterns and new chemicals, all of a sudden now I'm so much happier day to day because I'm imagining the best possible scenario. I'm imagining the scenario that's very exciting and happy and, uh, you know, peaceful instead of the one that's so scary and who knows what might happen in the future, but playing it out in my head beforehand in the negative way is just creating a negative experience for who knows how long until the, the, you know, event actually happens. And how often do we get it absolutely right? For the for better and for worse, you know, how many times have you visualized this is exactly how the games are going to go, and then you go there <laughs> and you show up and it goes exactly right. no, it, it's 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 an estimation, it's an approximation. Right. Right. I tell people this quite frequently. I'm like, listen, if you don't like surprises and you don't have a sense of humor, that's two negations for you, everybody, because I track what comes <laughs> out of my mouth. I'm gonna say it again: if you don't have If you don't like surprises and you don't have a sense of humor, then you're in the wrong place because Mm -hmm. earth life, it's full of surprises every day. And um, Mm -hmm. there's plenty of stuff to laugh about, including ourself and which is hard to do. It's really hard to do. Everybody laugh at ourself. Trust me. Um, You, you, the, the, the comedy is happening when our breath is trapped in our chest, which circles right back to what you said that that the story can 
can can be hard to change. Uh, the fastest way, everybody, to to change a story is to get the words on paper, get it in writing. The mm-hmm. fastest way to slow down a story is to get it in writing. Again, we're talking about the mechanics, the mechanism of story. The faster the story goes, the tighter the breath is in the chest, the harder it is to change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When the breath – get the words on paper and when the breath starts to loosen up, that's, that's when people – breath in the, che- in the chest, that's attachment. Breath low and slow, down regulation. Then it's so much easier to, to – well, to change words. And yeah, I mean what's more seductive than our own voice in our own head? That can trick mm-hmm. us into all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know? right. it's, it's my own voice. Of course it's true. Right. And we like – our ego likes to – make us think that we are in control, but there's so many things that we are not in control of, like you said. And, and, uh, and so, like you said, having a little bit of play and fun and surprise realizing who knows what's going to happen. Um, but I'm, I'm open to it. I've got a question for you. I know I'm the guest on your show. I've got a question <laughs> for you, if that's okay, of which is, it's one of the things we talked about, uh, earlier. How prevalent is the imposter syndrome? in 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 the coaching world well just in the world (laughs) i can relate i think on so in so many areas of life being myself being a doctor going through medical school medical training friends family no matter what I, i have yet to meet anyone in any career path or setting that has not expressed some experience of imposter syndrome and coaching as well. I think that we all, we all start somewhere, but we tend to look at other people as having the people who maybe have more experience or get better results and compare ourselves a lot of times and think that we're not as good or we're not good enough, or we don't deserve to be in the position that we might be in. It first, it first dawned on me, overtly dawned on me in the summer of 2011 that, that something's going on here with the imposter syndrome. I went, to, I went to London and stayed there for, well, the summer. Mm-hmm. And I, I had one person come in for, um, she was referred, uh, came in for some sessions, and she was in a uh, C-suite level um, of a of a consulting company for oil and gas, and we got into some stories. And she was like, "I was like, what do you want to work on?" And she goes, "Every single day when I walk into the office, I am terrified that I'm going to be found out. Uh, that I'm going to be found out that I'm in comp." She was crushing the game. She was putting up some of the top top two, three best numbers year over year in her business. Mm-hmm. She was, people looked to her. She keynoted, she keynoted events. And, and regardless of that evidence, mm-hmm. which also hasn't been written down, which is another thing we'll talk about here in a second. Okay. How to supercharge your affirmations, folks. I got mm-hmm. two of, in my personal and professional opinion, I've got the two best pieces of, of, of advice, technical advice for you to supercharge your affirmations that you can use with yourself today and with your clients if you work with people in a mindset in a mindset way. Oh, we're and coming she, back to that later. That sounds powerful. Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a f- fantastic uh, addition to this conversation. It, it it double it piggybacks on what we've already done um in the in the first in the first call or the first mm-hmm. podcast and she was it it was crippling her as far as moving her career forward. And guess what? We got those stories written down because they weren't written down. And then when we got into there, into the emotions and feelings of of the stuff and and tracked them down, she was bullied in school. She was Mm -hmm. bullied in middle school. And that stuff was in there. Time doesn't apply to the emotional body. I just said I've said that twice. Think about Mm -hmm. it, folks. Mm -hmm. And it was showing up in her adult life. And we went into that bullying and did some other stuff. And in in she walked out the door and my phone was started ringing off the hook and she she um i worked with people in the c suite all summer long and 80 85% of them had similar stories 
Mm-hmm. Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. I shouldn't be. Look at the words. I shouldn't be where I am, <laughs> but I'm where I am. It's, right. If we want to get all Byron Katie about it, it's arguing with reality. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, I'm not good enough to be in a relationship with my wife. Are you in a relationship with your wife? Yeah, we've been married for 20 years. But and she's <laughs> she's happy. But I've got this thing running in the background that nobody will ever love me because of something mm-hmm. that happened way back then. Mm-hmm. And so l- listen, everybody, this, the pen, this thing really is a magic wand. A powerful and tool. We really can. Spells, the definition of a spell, not mine, Webster's, a word or a combination of words of great influence. That's it. It goes both ways. And so, um, and then, and then I think back to my flash in the pan fight career, I was a mediocre athlete. And we had a bunch of studs in the gym and um, how I won fights, I had a winning record. How I won fights is that I, I, just, I kept showing up for practice and then there was something in me that responded really well to pressure. So we get in the mm-hmm. ring and just something else came alive. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Um, but anyway, I relentlessly compared myself to these other guys and I, I never felt like I was good enough as a fighter. OK, mm-hmm. and that haunted me um, until I got down to the root of the situation, which was also some bullying for me when I was mm-hmm. a kid, which mm-hmm. is one of the reasons I turned into a fighter in the first place, because I'm mm-hmm. uh, that's never happened again. OK, I'm going to go on the right. offensive now. Right. And and so it was this this was the, it was this adult compensation mechanism for some unresolved stories. And mm-hmm. guess I hadn't written those down either. Mm-hmm. And so this is my three hundred and. 55th podcast, Julie Fouché, that I've gone wow. on. Talking about, <laughs> yeah, talking about words. And this past February, I went down um, and did the Can You Survive This podcast with Jeff Gonzalez out of the Sheepdog response. He's a, he's a former Navy SEAL. Okay. Um, Sheepdog uh, uh, response and tactical. That's uh, Tim Kennedy's okay. organization. And, and so I go down there and I do that podcast with them and I, I talk about the exact same thing that I'm talking about here. And at the end, when we're done, he goes, look at the words, look at the words. He goes, yeah, I think, I think there's kind of a lot of that in our community. Soft talk. <laughs> I think there's kind, kind of, of, right. A lot yeah. of that in our community. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I was like, not that I needed any, any more evidence but i was like that's the final nail in the coffin about imposter syndrome that can i use a four letter word that stuff is everywhere yeah. that stuff is everywhere and it, yeah. it's it's the c suite sports medicine um top tier tier 1 special forces units cuz we got a glitch in our language everybody mm-hmm. and it has nothing to do with how skilled someone is mm-hmm. or how smart someone is mm-hmm. or how dedicated they are to their craft if 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 some of those stories are left unchecked which is what we help people do within lifted mm-hmm. um then guess what you're 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 however far you're going to go in your career you're going to be dragging that ball and chain around and that's so much mm-hmm. fun to, to to take off Right. I have, you reminded me of two examples in my own life. There's many examples, but one that I've shared before, I think on my podcast, but definitely on other podcasts, when I was competing in the CrossFit games, I, my first year was 2010. I surprised myself by finishing in fifth place. My first year, I definitely felt like an imposter. I remember sitting in the warm up area next to women that I had watched online the year before and was very intimidated by and finished in fifth place. And then the next year, the following year, I, the thoughts in my head were, what if it was just a fluke? What if I, you know, instead of thinking, you know, I, I can podium this year. I was thinking, please just don't do worse than I did last year. And I went into the final event in third place, positioned to be on the podium. The event on paper was something I traditionally have been very good at. It was a long chipper, lots of different exercises. But because I had that story in my head and kept repeating it, don't do worse than last year, don't do worse than last year, I completely botched the event. 
and finish the weekend in fifth place, the exact same place that I had finished the year before. When I, I truly believe if I had changed my story and said, I could win the CrossFit Games, I might have won or I might have finished on the podium, but more than likely it would have been a better outcome overall. And that was a big lesson for me. And something I think my, my entire career as a CrossFit Games athlete was about learning the power of my mindset and how that had been holding me back. And each year growing and getting a little bit better at that. I remember the next year, or no, I think this was the same year, 2011. I There was an event where we had to push, it was a sled dog event or sled something with a sled. We had to do double unders and push a sled. And the first round, you push it partway across the floor. You go back and do double unders. Then you push it two thirds of the way. And then you push it the full way. I'm on my last sled push. And I am right next to Annie Thor's daughter who had won the CrossFit Games the year before. And she is behind me. I'm winning the event. I'm on my last sled push. Each, each first, second round, I had pushed the sled the entire distance without stopping, no problem. And I'm in the last push. She's behind me. And for some reason, I just stop. I stop and I shake my arms out and then she passes me and then I finish right behind her. And as I've gone back to that event and what was going through my head, I had this story and this belief that I couldn't beat Annie Thor- Thor's daughter. She's the reigning champion. What, how could I be ahead of her? And that was the subconscious story that I was telling myself. And I believe why I stopped in that workout instead of finishing and winning the event. So these things are very powerful. And like you said, imposter syndrome exists everywhere. Look, look at the words she used, folks. Negation. Don't, don't finish <laughs> worse. Don't do worse than last year. Don't do worse than last year. I put a spell on you. No, take out you put in me. I put a spell on me. I'm spelling mm-hmm. on me all day long mm-hmm. for better and for worse. Because and, and it goes both ways, everybody. There are spells of a constrictive nature, ones that crowd the imagination, create dense, heavy energy, excess rigidity in the body, and trap the breath. Mm-hmm. Okay? Remember the stuff we started with? She never lets me live my life. Mm-hmm. That's a story. That's a spell that's going to do that to my imagination, my energy, my body, and my breathing because it's it it has to. Two plus two equals four for me and Julie and everybody else. And then, you know, I I could win the CrossFit Games. That's a different combination of words that put a different picture in my imagination, create a different set of energy. So certain spells constrict. Certain spells expand. They they zoom us out, make the, the 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 pictures in the movies lighter and brighter. The energy lightens, brightens. The body relaxes. The breath descends down into the abdomen, and then you're in the zone. If we want to use some some uh, appropriate language, people talk about being in their head. Okay, we'll just talk about the fight game. People talk about uh, you know, f- fighters in his head. Uh, she's in her head and you, you, you feel like a robot. You're rigid. You, it's called, you can't get your shots off. Everything feels stiff like the Tin Man. And then you're mm-hmm. in the zone. Okay. You're in flow. Carol Dweck very much approves of this conversation, even though she's Carol Dweck. She doesn't know anything. She doesn't know us. <laughs> so fixed mindset, growth mindset. If you've got a fixed mindset, that means you have a fixed language as in you're fixating and it's tight and blocked in. Uh, growth mindset, you've got a growth language. Um, because guess what? Our mindset is the story that we tell ourselves. What are, what's our story built of? Words. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's so complicated. And, and yeah, the, the reality is, is, is when we know, fine, I'll get all Alan Watts about it again. I love Alan Watts. When we, this is my favorite Alan Watts quote. When we learn to think about our thinking, we become alive in a new way. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that again. When we learn to think about our thinking, we become alive in a new way. Most people are not thinking about their thinking. They're just thinking. There's a big mm-hmm. difference. Mm-hmm. And the fastest, bestest, most ever bestest way 
to think about our thinking, everybody, is to pick up the pen and get the words on paper and do not let yourself believe them, even though you could still feel strongly about them. Look at the words. Where mm-hmm. are the negations? Where's the projections? Where's the thinks and the maybes and the sortas and the kindas and the mites, the soft talk? And you start making some adjustments in the words and your mindset's going to change because mm-hmm. we're, we're participating in this. Mm-hmm. Um, celebrating wins. So, so is this a good time to talk about affirmations? Absolutely. I was going to go there next. So let's do it. Perfect. We're on the same page. Get it. So <laughs> most people, uh, their affirmations fall short because of two main things. First, they do not, they have not compiled and presented evidence to validate their affirmations truth, to validate the affirmation being true. Okay, so I could podium at the games. Um, what do I mean by, what do I mean by, uh, gathering and presenting evidence. So most people have not titled or they've not written out the stories of ouch and pain and sting and woe. And most people have not written out the times they've knocked it out of the park, the times Mm -hmm. that they've gotten it right, the Mm -hmm. times that other people were there for them, nice things people have said to them. Most people have not written that down either. So going back to what I said initially, most people are very underwritten, and I'm not talking about insurance. So <laughs> what you want to do, everybody, and this, this could be more challenging than people think, usually it is, is pick up a pen and pick a specific event. So, Julie, the, 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 the specific moment in your CrossFit career, and I'm sure there's other chapters of different stages of your life that we could go find tons of, tons of uh, wins to celebrate. That's what this is called, celebrating wins. And your clients have wins to share, everybody. Trust me, Mm -hmm. they absolutely do. Mm -hmm. And until they're written down, until they're written down, they're not going to have the same meaning. They're not going to be as meaningful. So in your CrossFit career, what's what's the one thing you were the most proud of? Specific event, specific moment in time. Well, for me, the event that I'm most proud of and that sticks in my mind is the Pendleton Camp Pendleton triathlon event in 2012. Perfect. Have you ever written that down? I'm not sure. (laughs) I I might have, but I know I've talked about it a lot. (laughs) And when I say write it down, folks, it's a very specific kind of writing. As in title it Camp Pendleton triathlon. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you write out what happened. This is not half sentences. Do not get it done. Half the time, a gratitude journal, a gratitude practice is a net negative. Name three things you're grateful for. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, my health, my family, and my girlfriend. Three half sentences. That's not enough detail. That's not Mm -hmm. enough detail to summon the gratitude. And then people are like, man, I really should be grateful for those things, but I'm not. That means I'm a Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And so on the ne- quote unquote negative side of the street, the devil is in the details for the negative stuff. The devil being the energy and the motion and the, and the emotion that's still in there, even though it happened 20 years ago, and the meaning that we assigned to it. Because it's not, the, not a lot, of, most of the time, it's not the story that gets us, it's the meaning that we assign to the story that gets us. On the celebrating the win side, the angels are in the details. The angels are in the details, as in the positive feelings and emotions. Okay, mm-hmm. and what what does that mean about you that you did the, the Camp Pendleton uh, uh, triathlon in in I believe it was 2011? What does that mean about you? And people have not assigned meaning to those things. So go kick, go go gather the wins, write them out. And then what that does is it, it shows people that, oh, wait a minute, I am good enough. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, wow. I'm presenting evidence. I'm making a case for myself that I am good enough. Most people, and this is where the imposter syndrome and victim mentality come from, are busy making a case against themselves and relentlessly presenting evidence. Remember when that happened? Remember when he did that? Remember <laughs> this? Remember that? 
and, and you're like, you said all that stuff yesterday. It doesn't matter. The thing won't stop mm-hmm. until you write those stories down. That's how you stop that stuff. Absolutely. Yep. And Absolutely. then I've seen you, this evidence. As go ahead. A, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I've seen this in my own experience. For one, you remind me of uh, BJ Fogg, who I've interviewed on the podcast before as well. He's a behavior scientist at Stanford, and he talks about celebrating wins and how when they've studied this, it's not just the the win or the affirmation, it's the emotion associated with it. And I and that's what you're saying is that you have to really get to the, emo- not just writing down what you're grateful for, but feeling the gratitude associated with that thing. And I've, I've had this experience a couple of times where I maybe get to the end of the week and I start having all these negative thoughts. Oh, I didn't get everything done I wanted to do, or that, you know, this week was a failure or things like that, that are very extreme. And when I've forced myself to sit down and write down in a journal, here are all the things that happened this week that were really great. Here are the things that were positive, that I accomplished, that were good things that happened. I then all of a sudden feel so much lighter and I feel empowered and I feel more confident. And even having a similar practice day to day, at the end of the day, if you write down, here are some things that happened today that were great. Instead, when we as humans, I think we tend to focus on the negative, the things that didn't go so well or how we fell short instead of the things that happened and just drawing your attention to those can really uh, can really shift your physiology and your experience. Thousand percent. We really are on the same page because that dovetails perfectly and immediately into the second piece of advice mm-hmm. for supercharging our affirmations. So most of the time, um, when, when people are talking about, for the people that affirmations are like, I don't know about those things, they, they, there's only a handful of things that they say about them in a negative way. And the number one thing is I just don't feel it. Mm-hmm. I just don't feel it. And the two main reasons that pe- – because once you do feel it, now you're in a completely different conversation. Mm-hmm. The two main reasons that people do not feel – what they know they could from their affirmations is that one, the evidence hasn't been presented to substantiate the validity of the affirmation, also known as celebrating the wins. Write down the wins and you're like, then you got the proof. Now that's that's eat more easy. There's the proof that mm-hmm. I can go do the thing. Okay. Mm-hmm. There's the proof that I can go do it because I've done it before. Mm-hmm. Um and then the second thing is people repeating their affirmations with their breath trapped in their chest. Mm -hmm. This is huge, everybody. And this is something that you can do five minutes after you're done listening to this and and go and have a, a, you can feel it. You go, oh, that guy was serious. I am serious. I'm also sincere about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what what, what am I, a a little more context. So um, here's what repeating affirmations sound like when my breath is trapped in my chest. Everything's going to work out. I'm making a lot of progress. I'm in a great community. I'm really supported. Um, I'm, I know where I'm going. I deserve love. I can be in a healthy relationship. And, and most of the time, it's faster than that. Mm-hmm, okay? Mm-hmm. Breath trapped in the chest. Here, here get, get a load of this, folks. Your words versus your breath, the breath is going to win. When the breath is trapped in the chest, it's it's all up here. It's this mental thing. When you get a breath in between each affirmation, three ways of saying the same thing, it helps you embody the concept. It helps you take it to heart. It helps you socialize the idea. And here's what that sounds like. I'm making a lot of progress. I've built a lot of momentum. I deserve to be loved. I'm in a solid community. Great things are going to happen if I keep going. And so on and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're going to feel those. Mm -hmm. 
energy. So the, the breath is the vector, everybody. It's the missing link when it comes to your affirmations. And if I had to pick one of the two, give me the breathing. If I had to pick one or two over, because sometimes picking up the pen and finding some wins, that takes a little while. You can get the breath in between each sentence real fast. You can do that Absolutely. in one minute and you'll be like, oh my God, I feel this stuff now. And it's like, listen to Dr. Julie. Well, uh, listen to t- doc, doc, it's not doctor's or it's doctor's advice. When you feel the, so the problem, half the problem, everybody is, is words and breath trapped in the chest. So negative words, breath trapped in the chest, you're getting all the same stories, all the same pictures, all the same negative feels, all the same conversations. That's, Mm -hmm. that, that is so boring. Mm -hmm. That is so boring and played out and just, oh, you Mm -hmm. change, you use different words and breathe a little bit better. Guess what happens? You start to smile. Guess what happens? You start you start to laugh more because people breath trapped in their chest. You're not you're you're not. It's very it's very easy to take things too serious, and and when your breath is on when you're using better words and you're breathing more and you're smiling more and you're 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 laughing a little bit more. You're way more fun to be around. First and foremost mm-hmm. for yourself. It was Chris Williamson. Um, he said the hardest people to compete with are the ones that have a dedicated work ethic, okay, and are having fun. You put those two things together. He's like over mm-hmm. a timeline, they're, they're they're the hardest people to compete with because they just keep going. And the better mm-hmm. you're breathing, the more fun you're having. That's right. That's right. Well, I've found this myself. I've been saying affirmations daily for the last year and a half. And I find there are days where I'm a little more stressed and I'm thinking, okay, I just got to say my affirmations. I got to check this off the list when I'm not saying them with as much breath and as, as much emotion. And I can feel the difference that those are not really sinking in and, and not things that I'm believing as much versus I, I also use music. So I like to put on some really fun music and dance around a little bit while I'm saying them or say them in the car, listen like really loud with emotion while I'm listening to music. And on those days, you you can tell you are really believing them. And so I found that to be really powerful myself. And I think going back to the affirmations and rewriting our stories or thinking about how what we say and what we write down becomes our reality. I think you hear about this all the time with manifesting or writing a writing down your vision board or having a vision board or things like that. I've written a what I call a life plan, which essentially is writing down a vision for where I want to be in my life in a number of different areas and connecting it also with a why because I know you've said that's important. And reading that regularly so that it's something that has been written down and it's something that I am thinking about and exposing my mind to on a regular basis. And it's incredible to see how that then really does start to become your reality. Things just start happening in in your life once you write that down because of how powerful the words are in the writing. And, and, uh, and, And then the daily reflection, like you said, writing down what are the wins for the day with emotion. And then the things that didn't go so well, we, we don't want to ignore those, but writing them down and saying, how would it, how could I have done this differently? Or how could it have gone differently? Visualizing that with some emotion as well, so that you're learning and growing from it and not getting stuck in the negative story. Thousand percent. And we are very, we are the exact polar opposite of whatever, uh, ignoring the, the fails and and the, the the mishaps and the misfortunes. No, the exact opposite. It's you, y'all. You, you don't you don't have to do anything. You don't got to do anything, everybody. And if you you, you got to go in there. If you want to get over it, it's not about getting over it. It's about getting into it and going through it. Mm-hmm. Because the the um the stories, specific stories of ouch and pain. It's like a spicy Thai dish. Okay. <laughs> burn going in, 
Okay. It smolders while it's in there. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, go to your Thai restaurant or the hot <laughs> thing they got, message me in 48 hours. You'll un- it they burn going in, they smolder while they're in there, as in they affect how we're seeing ourselves in the world. They affect the story we tell ourselves to ourselves. And then it burns coming out. Mm -hmm. It burns coming out when we pick up the pen and write the thing down and the feelings show up again. And and, and so it's, it's Joseph Campbell said it, he said, any feeling felt all the way through is bliss. And most Mm -hmm. people are stuck with those stories in their head, the feelings, Mm -hmm. same old thing. And they're, they're doing their very best to not feel that stuff again. Now that's where the gangster gear is very valuable in this line of work. You got to, you got to go in there, everybody. Mm -hmm. It's not going to change if you don't. It will change. Absolutely. It's you spend so much more energy and pain trying to keep it in there oh, and God. not feel it than if you just let it let it out, feel it and release it. Bring it up into your awareness, into the light and and release it. And that's how we can really be set free from these these stories or these spells, as you said. Good one. I love it. Well, I know I asked you on the last episode that three questions I ask at the end of every podcast. So I don't know that we'll repeat those, but is there anything that you've started doing in the last year or so that has been a real game changer for your own health? Any new habits or practices? I've been doing more mobility. Mm. Then when I mean, when I mean lately, I mean over the past year, year and a half, um, more mobility practices. And I, I do 15 to 20 minutes of mobility work almost every day. And um, so I, I jacked myself up a long time ago in the middle of my fight career and everything stopped. I turned into a, a grown ass man, baby. I used it as proof that uh, it's a technical term, everybody. I used it as proof that I was something wrong with me and I was mm-hmm. doomed to fail and the whole thing stopped. And it was, a, I turned a, a molehill into a mountain. And, and notice the change in his story. I jacked myself up instead oh yeah. of what your story had been before, right? Oh, oh uh, yeah, for sure. Because I had somebody to blame. Mm-hmm. I was the victim. I had a perfect villain. I had a perfect villain. And um, and then, you know, getting into these mobility practices, I was like, wow, man, if I'd had this, when, when's the best time to plant a tree 15 years ago? When's the second best time? Today, right? And so... um that's that's been a very big deal that's been a very big deal did we talk about i know we're we're at the end did we talk about my elbow last time i don't think so i don't think so yeah so here's 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 how i know that that changing stories work going into stories work so 2002 i moved to thailand i'm going to be over there for a year i was over there for 10 years which still sounds strange to say i went over there for the thai boxing had to jack myself up, had a second knee surgery over there shortly thereafter. The world ended. Okay. Mm-hmm. And and then fast forward to 2018. I was actually with Mike Bledsoe. We were mm-hmm. um in um uh Phoenix and, and we go to a jujitsu school and um my jujitsu is very antiquated. Uh it's antique, should be in a museum. Anyway, we go mm-hmm. in there and I was rolling with some of their studs and and this guy gets me in some joy. He puts me in a move, Dr. Julie, and I think I can get out. I didn't know what it was until I found out what it was. It was something I didn't know what it was, and I couldn't get out, and my elbow explodes. This guy rips my arm out of socket. And uh, I, I look at him. He lets go. I look at my arm. I look at him. I look at my arm, and then I go to my calendar. And I'm like, okay, that, that kettlebell certification in six weeks, and on it, we'll just take that off the calendar because I just done something. And then, and then I go, okay, well, paleo effects is coming in, in about a month and you know, we're running a booth and I only really need one arm to do that. Pascal's coming in, she can assist and that's cool. So we'll do that. And then I turn to Mike, I'm like, Hey Mike, we got to leave buddy. Cause uh, yeah, this thing just happened. And we walk out the door and my arms flopping around and I'm talking to him about a girl I think's cute because I was able to control the story in my mind and not turn it into or use it as proof that I wasn't good enough and I was doomed to fail and there's something wrong with me. It was just something that happened. And I mean, I had a Tommy John. I mean, that's, that's a, it's a, it's just when they, that's, it's a legit surgery. I mean, I blew up my arm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
when they go in your leg and they get some important stuff and lace your arm back up. And and I healed well and just the whole thing was smooth because I I I, I manic moderated and manicured my story because I knew the words. Mm-hmm. Abra, good, Abra. It's powerful. It's powerful. Thank you for sharing that one. I love that. And I, I love the uh the mobility practice. That's it's great. Huge. I remember from our last conversation, your morning walks were, were mm-hmm. a big thing where you're getting some exercise, some sunshine. It's a great day. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Mark. As always, this has been wonderful. I'm always learning from you and so excited to share this with listeners. And I'm sure we will do it again in the future. So where if people really want to dive into this and they want to learn more they want to engage in the Enlifted program and training, where can they find, what, what are their options? The, the best one is to go to our website, enlifted.me. That's all about the certifications. Uh, and there, there'll, there'll be a pop-up, everybody. And, and it's the seven-day, it's now famous, seven-day Enlifted Soft Talk Challenge. It's free. It's awesome. If you're into cool, free, awesome stuff, go mm-hmm. there. and and plug in your plug in your email and it'll help you get the thinks and the maybes and the mites and the sort ofs and the kind ofs and the and the guesses and the perhapses and the almost likes and all that junk out of your language and you'll like what happens you'll feel it mm-hmm. love that and the unlifted coaches essentials is a a course that you have that's available too that I just recently participated in and found to be very helpful. So I would recommend that to anyone listening as well. Thank you, Julie. (laughs) Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. And we'll talk again soon. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.